Uh, hi everyone, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you so much for coming. It's really uh, heartwarming to see my fellow uh, social science comrades and my fellow Ukrainian club members and uh, thank you very much. So yes, yeah, so as Askar said, uh, this, um, this research is coming out of my dissertation. Uh, my principal interest is in public participation in contemporary military conflict. So I will start my presentation with an anecdote. In 2015, uh, there was a viral news story about a 10-year-old guy named Danilko, or Daniel, who ran a birthday fundraiser to then purchase an SUV, a sports utility vehicle, which he deployed, which he donated to the 93rd Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Now, I must say that 10-year-olds routinely deploy vehicles at battlefronts, but they do so in computer games. Mm. So the fact that this sports util utility vehicle was very physical, was very real, and was deployed by a miner who was a foreign citizen at an active battlefront raises questions about the comprehensive social infrastructures that needed to be in place for this to happen, right? When we order something from Amazon, things don't just pop up on our, at our doorstep. There is a comprehensive infrastructure, uh, and it's socio-technical infrastructure, which means it has human and technological actants that provide, that make for this to happen. And so in order for uh, Danilko to be able to do this, um, there needed to be somebody who would transfer this money to an organization or a person over in Ukraine, then there needed to be a person in the European Union who would purchase a used sports, sports utility vehicle uh, and then who would drive it over to Ukraine. There would need to be some legal help in making and uh, getting license plates and everything else for this car. There would need to be a mechanic who uh, would have to make sure it's in a good working condition and maybe um, do some minor fix-ups. Uh, they would need to purchase gas and finally there would need to be a driver who would drive it and give it to the soldiers. So these are the soldiers of the Ukrainian army that are fighting the Russian army in eastern Ukraine in an ongoing uh, military conflict that started in 2014. Uh, actually yesterday was one of the deadliest uh, days in this conflict as of 2019. So this conflict is still very much ongoing. And so uh, my interest here is how uh, do digital media open new pathways for uh, civic engagement and for public participation in, a, in conflicts. So I use a notion of battlefront assemblages as a way to theorize on the role of media in uh, cont contemporary conflicts. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just turn it off. Yes. So uh, this is an assemblage. This is actually an art assemblage which was created by Daria Marchenko and Daniel Green. They're Ukrainian artists who use rubble um, that they find at the battlefronts to portray the meanings of the Ukrainian military conflict and kind of the multiple heterogeneous objects that participate in the ways in which the wars are perceived and are uh, remembered uh, by people. So this uh, particular assemblage consists of shoulder straps of all the countries who were the guarantors of Ukrainian sovereignty uh, by signing uh, the Budapest Memorandum of, 2000, uh, of 1994. So uh, the Budapest Memorandum was an international treaty uh, signed by the US, uh, the, uh, the EU and, and Russia to prevent, uh, to basically to preserve territorial integrity of Ukraine in case uh, it were under attack. And in, in response, in exchange for those security assurances, Ukraine had to surrender its second largest nuclear potential uh, and so become a non-nuclear state. And so this assemblage uh, touches upon the questions of which role do the events, media, uh, <laughs> armies play in a military conflict. And so assemblages are these historically situated heterogeneous objects that contain people, technologies, events, identities, and other, other things uh, mixed together. And this is my uh, new materialist ontology as a way to transcend those dualism because because in the digital, in the mediated age, it's really difficult to disentangle digital from the physical, civil from the military, uh, real from the mediated. And so that is a way to kind of work with these uh, binaries on a non-binary scale. And so uh, the idea here is that, our, that there are effect economies that draw citizens, governments, artifacts and events and media into a military conflict. So I'm going to talk about the role of media in warfare historically, then talk a little bit about the Ukrainian conflict as of uh, the present ongoing conflict, and then I'm gonna, going to finish with the public participation in this conflict. 
So, uh, it is a speculation, but uh, wars have always been mediated, right? And so there have not been uh, many instances of unmediated experiences of war, apart from those uh, experienced by the soldiers who actually fight in the wars. So there are usually soldiers who directly get to fight in wars, and there's also a couple of onlookers who get to see uh, these battles. But the fact that all of us find out about wars is because uh, there is media that uh, transmits this information to the public. And so, uh, as in many cultural studies, it's nice to start with the ancient Greeks. So in 8th century BC, there was an, a wonderful epic poem written in dactylic hexametron by Homer. Has anybody read the Iliad? <laughs> Yes, wonderful, wonderful epic uh, poem, which was which uh, was uh, the oral tradition of uh, telling histories about war, and so it wasn't only the ancient Greeks. Uh, I think a lot of countries, a lot of nations, had their own oral traditions of uh, war storytelling. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, painted by a Ukrainian painter Trutovsky, uh, which depicts someone named Kobzar. So Kobza is a string instrument, uh, it's a comprehensive string instrument used by the Ukrainian storytellers. They were usually men who were visually impaired and who had little boys who would lead them around and who would tell the stories of epic battles fought by the Cossacks and then later on in public places. So that was a way to find out about uh, the, uh, the wars, specifically, particularly by, by the public who might not have necessarily been literate so that was a way of uh, kind of storytelling. And media scholars uh, recognized the Crimean War of 1853 to 56 as the first mass mediated war in, uh, in the history. Would anybody like to guess which medium made the Crimean War the first mediated war? Take a stab. 1850, so the second half of the 19th century. Yes, thank you. The Telegraph? The telegraph is a good one. It was uh, lar widely used, but a little bit earlier. But it still wasn't ma a mass uh, medium. A mass as a, okay. Yes. Sorry. Photographs? Yeah. The photographs. Right, so the photographs were something that turned the Crimean War into, the <clears throat> into a mediated war. So this is a very famous uh, shot. It's called The Valley of the Shadow of Death, uh, shot by Roger Fenton, who was a British photographer in 1855. Uh, it shows a lot of rubble and cannonballs. Uh, it shows a valley littered with uh, cannonballs and rubble. And this is what made the experiences of war come closer to us. So a uh, photograph was a medium that uh, kind of could transcend distance and bring the spectators closer to uh, the battlefront. And that got to, uh, to be really crucial in the ways in which wars were fought, but also in which, ways in which wars were perceived by the public. An interesting fact is that Roger Fenton, he was subsidized by, well, he was um, sent by, um, by the Crown to, uh, to photograph these wars, but he spent most of his time uh, photographing these elaborate insinuations of heroic uh, armies in gardens in England. So the ways in which the war was represented kind of differed from the real, uh, real experience of the war because war became a matter of public consumption a matter of public spectacle, and that was the first time when war was found entertaining for the masses. So this is um, the actual uh, story of how uh, pictures got to change the representation of war. Uh, an interesting thing about photographs is that they are out of their context, they are taken in one context, but they're perceived in another. They do not have any <laughs> inherent frames or any, um, Apart from the symbolism that they carry, they do not, they're really interpreted by the seer in a very different context than they were taken. And so a lot of meaning can be ascribed to photographs, right? If you don't know that this was the Valley of the Shadow of Death, you might not have understood the whole tragedy behind this photo. Uh, and so photographs can be ascribed meaning by the people who look at them. This was used by Queen Victoria when she collected these series of heroic photos um, of the uh, British army. Um, and so as, as opposed to narrative, which has a clear beginning, clear end, and gets to frame a lot of what, what is happening, photographs do not. And so as they travel, they may uh, cause for a new set of meanings to emerge um, as, as we see them. So, right, so telegraph was a big uh, 
thing in warfare as well. Telegraph kind of uh, destroyed the tyranny of the distance. We no longer needed to send horseback riders to set, to pass our news to um, to other divisions of armies and things like that. So uh, telegraph, uh, in a way, increased the scale of a military conflict. Uh, radio was a very big thing in World War II. It was successfully <coughs> utilized by the German army in their Blitzkrieg, so they could coordinate among each other. But also the reason why they were so successful in specifically against in the battle against the French is that radio uh, could be used to uh, transmit propaganda. And that is something that the Germans were very good at uh, and that they utilized to uh, get military victories over the French. And then television. Uh, so, so basically starting from the photographs and then moving, kind of progressing um, in, the in time, uh, we could see the public getting more and more invested in war as a military affair, but also uh, more having kind of their own opinion, but also uh, how the public starts to shape how wars are being fought. And so with the uh, onset of television, particularly the 24-hour broadcasting, the very famously known CNN effect, in which the public perceptions of warfare get to inform foreign policy decisions. So a lot of the wars were fought in a ways that public thought was uh, expedient. So this is so with the television, the news cycle really affected the perception of warfare by the public and uh, allowed for the public through their channels of democratic representation to influence the course of their country's fighting wars. Uh, so it moves. Uh, this is the kind of movement that that went historically, uh, and only with the uh, TV, the public kind of got a an act, a more active role to play as not only consumers but also in shaping military decisions. So now uh, enter the deep mediatization with the onset with the emergence of digital technologies. There is a, a state called deep mediatization, which is characterized by the higher order processes of societal transformation. So on the one hand, there's rapid advancement of digital technologies. On the other hand, it is humans increasing reliance on these digital technologies as humans go about their daily lives. And as an outcome, the technology got to fundamentally restructure the social relationships that uh, of humans who rely on it. And so this uh, growing interdependence is known as the deep mediatization. Um, and so with the digital media, particularly in the starting from maybe 2000s or 2005, uh, digital media has introduced profound changes into how wars are fought. So mediatized warfare is the idea that uh, war, uh, contemporary wars cannot be disentangled from the media and have to be understood in the context of the media that is used to, to mediate them, basically. So there are three main things that changed uh, the course of warfare with the onset of the digital technologies. First is the emergence of cyberspace as a field of active military operations. That is going to only increase with the uh, as we transition from the Web 2.0, which is the social media, to Web 3.0, which is the Internet of Things. There's a lot of uh, independent interconnected devices that collect a lot of data and that can be easily hacked. And so cybersecurity is a big uh, national security priority nowadays. And that is all introduced by the uh, technological advancements in the digital realm. So cyberspace is one, but it's a very limited understanding of what mediatized warfare can do. Virality is another uh, feature of mediatized warfare. Virality itself is the rapid spread of information that is uh, that has two characteristics. First is its speed, right? It is very, there are events that get spread very fast. But second is the frequency. There used to be viral events since the beginning of times. People always like to talk about certain things, but it took much, much longer for them to uh, spread as opposed to uh, the current mediated environments in which they can rapidly spread and seemingly random things can get very popular overnight, as we can see from the egg image on Instagram that became apparently the most popular image uh, ever shared. So with virality, it's really not, po not possible to predict how information is going to travel, and to what effect. So this is the first thing that um, makes it very difficult to establish any causal relationships in terms of the information that travels. But the third thing about the mediatized warfare is diffusion. Diffusion is the idea that uh, all of us carry sensors, we all have our smartphones, our cameras, 
and each and every one of us can contribute to the inf to the information that is going on in the battlefield. And as an outcome, it is really not possible for even for policymakers to assess these consequences of different events. Uh, before that, there used to be one mass media, that, and it was really possible to calculate the impact of certain things being uh, broadcasted. Right now, it is really very difficult because of this diffused character of warfare to predict any kinds of outcomes of military and other uh, digital actions that happen in, uh, during warfare. So, and also, so the most important thing about the digital media is that it made war as a matter of public participation. We as public now can actively, directly or indirectly participate in the, uh, in the uh, conduct of warfare. So there are uh, two ways, at least two ways, in which civilians can participate in mediatized conflicts. First is through citizen journalism, right, taking photographs and posting things. Uh, as we see them, or sharing some information. Uh, but second is through acts of humanitarian activism, and also acts of humanitarian activism and support to uh, their own armies is not new. There's been, historically there was, uh, for instance, the Underground Railroad was known to provide support to the Union soldiers. Uh, there was also a his, uh, history of supporting the armies in Ukraine, where uh, there was the Ukrainian insurgent army that existed for many dozens of years and that was much supported by its own population. So these are not new ideas, but the, the ways in which they, um, they can happen now are very different than um, they used to happen before. So if the Crimean War of 1853 was this mass-mediated spectacle, this uh, pompous, uh, grandiose uh, onset of the armies, the annexation of Crimea is marked by obscurity, it was a non-occupation, and it was marked by a sequence of non-events. This is something very different from the traditional fighting of warfare in which the armies were making themselves as visible as possible. Even the ISIS, army, the ISIS fighters uh, successfully conducted their online campaigns to showcase their military might and everything. In this case, there was nothing like that. So it was marked by obscurity. It was deliberately devoid of any symbolic, uh, any symbolism and any symbolic representation. So as you might recall, um, the polite green men, the soldiers that uh, did not have any markings on them, that uh, covertly captured uh, the critical infrastructure, first in Crimea, and then uh, in the eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, represents a shift in, uh, in the warfare, uh, which is marked by this absence of symbolism and absence of meaning. So if some, somebody were to photograph, there are very um, non-eventful photographs of that, uh, of that annexation. Uh, it was really not uh, what is thought of as warfare as such, but it was the annexation of, of the Ukrainian territories. So um, this is a Ukrainian context, just a kind of a refresher on what happened in Ukraine in 2014. So first, as you might remember, Ukraine had a, a revolution of dignity. Actually, we just um, commemorated the fifth anniversary of, uh, of, that, of the deadly protests. And uh, it started in 2013. A lot of people speculate that it started off a single uh, Facebook message by a Ukrainian activist. It's, it's really not true uh, as much as... Uh, but social media were really used to mobilize people uh, for participation in protests uh, <coughs> to an extent uh, to which possible. But mostly it was a, a, an act of digital and physical activism. Uh, what was interesting in the Revolution of Dignity is that it was the first... Um, mass mediated, uh, the first mediated protest, because back in the Orange Revolution in 2004, which I also got to uh, participate in, uh, that was before uh, the social media, and so the dynamics there were very different. What was also different is that uh, the Orange Revolution was during an active election campaigns, so the logistics, there were many uh, political headquarters of candidates who could organize the logistics of the protest. We're talking uh, November, December, uh, it's when it starts getting really cold, and so there needed to be a lot of infrastructure in place to facilitate the protests uh, on a scale that they were uh, happening in 2004. And so when the Revolution of Dignity was starting, there was this concern that it was in the middle, it was in between the major elections, and there were no um, 
infrastructural um, underpinnings of to, that are uh, able to sustain a large protest. So a lot of the uh, the organization of protest was grassroots organizing by uh, by by just civilians who uh, who who, who ran uh, logistics, who used uh, social media a lot to organize the logistics and sustain the protest for the many months. In February 2014, uh, five years ago, the protests turned deadly. Uh, more than 100 people were shot by snipers. Uh, they are called the Heavenly Hundreds. So, uh, so this was happening five years ago. And the annexation of Crimea also started happening in the February of 2014 by the non-occupation tactics. <coughs> then the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk people, People's Republic followed suit in uh, March 2014. Uh, the same thing happened as in Crimea, but while no shots were fired when Crimea was annexed, uh, in, the do in this case, the Ukrainian government launched the anti-terrorist operation, uh, which lasted for four years from March 2014 to uh, April 2018. The, the conflict is still ongoing, but it is no longer uh, framed as an anti-terrorist operation. Um, and so what happened is that there were a lot of battlefront volunteers, and by that I mean people who support, who engage in nonviolent uh, resistance, uh, people who support the Ukrainian army soldiers uh, at, on the battlefront against uh, the Russian occupation, and so which consisted of citizens and diasporas that uh, provided the humanitarian aid to the soldiers fighting and also to the civilians that uh, whose livelihoods got destroyed by the conflict. Uh, so. So these are the battlefront assemblages. This is uh, my analysis of the public participation in this conflict. I'm looking at the affordances provided by social media to organize uh, the resistance. I'm looking at local communities that were uh, active in battlefront volunteering, and I'm looking at the diasporas as actors who participated uh, in these socio-technical networks. Uh, some of my data, I will not, I will spare you of my methods, but I did 30 semi-structured interviews with uh, people who support the Ukrainian army, with the Ukrainian army soldiers, and with uh, some diaspora representatives to understand the role of digital media in uh, uh, the Ukrainian conflict. I used memoirs and historical data, also some survey data, uh, to uh, kind of ground the historical context. I used social network analysis, semantic networks, and infrastructure ethnography. These are just some of the things that I did. So uh, the first, the case that stands out in the uh, Ukrainian conflict is the, the case of Mariupol, uh, which is an unlike the very unlike which was a very unlikely candidate to uh, to resist occupation with the way that it was happening. So Mariupol is located right here. It is a strategic uh, maritime port and it's also a large industrial city. It's a half a million population industrial city and it. Uh, it's located right um, on, in the middle between Crimea and, and the occupied <coughs> eastern territories of Ukraine. So there was a lot of speculation going on that capturing Mariupol would allow for the Russian army to build a land bridge between the uh, between Crimea and Donetsk, which was a very uh, seemed like a very expedient thing uh, for Putin to to do. And so there was a lot of speculation once the eastern Ukrainian territories were getting war occupied that Mariupol will also be occupied because of its strategic importance. However, that did not happen and Mariupol was only occupied shortly. It was under the so-called separatist rule for only three months from, oh, this should be 2013, <coughs> between April 2014 and July 2014. And after that, uh, it got liberated by the Ukrainian armed forces and it is now, it's still uh, very much Ukrainian, very pro-Ukrainian and uh, as we know from the uh, last month's events, there is a new wave of violence uh, this time happening that happened in the Sea of Azov. Uh, partially, I think it is because it was not, it was really not possible to uh, occupy Mariupol with the things that were going on in Mariupol at the time. Uh, so Mariupol uh, had 89% Russophone population. As uh, you might recall, one of the um, official or unofficial reasons for the occupation were the uh, oppression of the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. Uh, so Mariupol had all every right to uh, to seem like it could have been oppressed because uh, it had 44% ethnic Russians, 
uh, it had a blatant lack of legitimacy, of state legitimacy, due to the absence of media. So in Mariupol there were no local media, and they only had the only local TV channel was rebroadcasting Russian television. Uh, the other channels that were mass media, particularly television channels, were owned by the oligarchs. They were not uh, specifically um, pro-Ukrainian, and they didn't do any uh, anything in building and cementing the Ukrainian identity since the beginning of Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine's independence. So it is really unsurprising that Mariupol, uh, Mar the population of Mariupol were, were pretty much inert and were not very much in support of the Ukrainian state at the time when these events were starting to happen. Um, and so when Mariupol started to be, to, to be subjected to these non-occupation tactics, and a very interesting thing happened. So about 20 activists <coughs> who were advocating, who were very active during the Euromaidan protests, created two Facebook groups, <coughs> which were hidden. They anonymized their profiles, and they started identifying patterns of separatist activity in their city. So one uh, of these patterns, you can see. Um, so the non-occupation tactics involved a lot of uh, political tourists. These were young men who were shipped from Russia, who were bused from Russia, actually, uh, from different cities in Russia, who were standing on the si on the streets of the cities in Ukraine, uh, protesting against um, the Ukrainian nationalists and advocating for the uh, for for the basically for Russian troops for uh, the to, for Russian troops to enter their city and liberate them from uh, the occupants. So, uh, so social media played a vital role when these political tourists started appearing in Mariupol. People could photograph them and then use uh, social media to identify who they were. And so these people claimed to be fighting uh, against the Ukrainian fascists, but then you can see uh, from their social media profiles their affinity for the Nazi ideology. So this was key, uh, these photos that circulated social media, particularly by citizens of Mariupol, were key in flipping the fascist, anti-fascist narrative, right? Because in Russia, uh, for, the lo for a long time, uh, Nazi Germany and fascism was a threat because they posed a threat to Russians. It was not a, an ideology that they opposed for ideological reasons. It was only a threat as long as it posed a threat to the Russian Empire. So s framing any activity in terms of fascism uh, basically means that it's a threat to all Russians. And so when they frame uh, the Ukrainian government as the fascist junta, which is uh, the nickname that they dubbed the Ukrainian government, it was to symbolize the threat that the Ukrainian government carries to the Russians and Russian speakers. Which, uh, which was not true, and which uh, the, the activists of Mariupol uh, were able to flip to explain that there's nothing fascist in protecting your own country, that there is uh, that these people who claim to be fighting fascism show uh, some disturbing uh, affinity to uh, to this ideology, and and this was one of the things that they were able to uh, to change during their uh, digital activism, let's say. Uh, they also engaged in many symbolic wars. They would paint a lot of things in public spaces in the colors of the Ukrainian flag to show that there are people in Mariupol who um, support the Ukrainian state. Uh, they would organize online and offline flash mobs. Offline, uh, the online flash mobs were very interesting. It was people who were fleeing the occupied territories of Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, sharing their experiences, what it meant to be Ukrainian to them sharing that I am Russian-speaking, uh, everybody in my family is Russian-speaking, but I am pro-Ukrainian. And this was a very uh, crucial way to identify uh, what Ukrainian identity meant to them, especially under the conditions of occupation. And the same with online flash mobs. There were people who would just uh, have uh, the state symbols, make them prominent, and would just be walking uh, in the streets of Mariupol, demonstrating their support for the Ukrainian state. And so by producing this counter-narrative to the fascist allegations, uh, basically the propaganda, they were able to, uh, to make a lot of citizens of Mariupol uh, understand the situation better, understand the, uh, the risks that the occupation of their city would carry to them, and, uh, and uh, support the Ukrainian state in the time when the state legitimacy hit an all-time low. So now state legitimacy is much stronger in Mariupol, uh, there's wide support for the Ukrainian state, and as an outcome, Mariupol could not be 
captured. Um, well, it, it could not be held, let's say. And they also, uh, these activists uh, organized a wide range of volunteering projects, and only in a couple of months, starting from uh, February, March of 2014, um, they were able to have uh, five to 7,000 uh, strong crowd in celebration of the Ukrainian independence, independence in 2014. So something that started with a group of, a really small group of 18 to 20 people who were very active on social media and, <coughs> and offline um, demonstrating their affinity for the Ukrainian state, uh, they were able to, uh, to have a, a kind of, a, to reach a, a mass of people who um, would uh, support the state. And that is why, uh, so, so these are some of the things that were used by the activists the affordance of anonymity, the affordance of interactivity, which basically allowed them to interact with each other anonymously. Uh, usually in public we cannot, we pose, uh, interaction in public poses a lot of risks. So if the city is occupied and you're trying to advocate for uh, for the Ukrainian state, that it posed, uh, it attracted a lot of risk to those people. So they were only able to interact with each other and to find each other because they would have patriotic avatars and patriotic nicknames um, that would allow them to find each other. Then there was the affordance of interactivity, the way that uh, people of Mariupol could interact with each other, and affordance of visibility, that their affinity, uh, their support for the Ukrainian state was highly visible among the local population, which had its own outcomes um, in terms of state legitimacy. So basically they were able to prevent occupation by building a national identity among those network publics um, in that city. Uh, so now kind of zooming out uh, the Ukraine's underground railroad is this uh, comprehensive social infrastructure that uh, that has the activist networks that were using the capacities of digital media to support the Ukrainian army. Uh, it is really difficult to estimate the uh, impact of, uh, of these Ukrainian battlefront volunteers, but uh, there are there is data that over 30 million of US dollars made its way to the Ukrainian battlefront through these initiatives. This is one um, example of such initiatives, the People's Project. It is a military crowdfunding website where people could support, could uh, purchase different equipment for the soldiers, support uh, different uh, initiatives that were organized by the People's Project. Uh, and basically what Battlefront Volunteering was, it was a network of warehouses for military and humanitarian aid uh, to support the Ukrainian armed forces. And these were also large-scale transnational networks because uh, some actors in these networks were uh, outside of Ukraine. So this is a typology of battlefront volunteering. Uh, that it, started all, it all started from alleviating the soldiers' immediate needs. So when the Ukrainian army had to be deployed in the eastern in, in the eastern part, uh, it was facing a well-equipped uh, enemy, and uh, the fact that Ukrainian army had been underfunded for since the beginning of Ukraine's independence, uh, and the fact that this mobilization had to be done very quickly, uh, did not uh, provide much time for the, the logistics for the military logistics to kick in. And so, a lot of the soldiers who were deployed at the battle uh, fronts they were lacking bare necessities that were provided by the volunteers. Uh, so starting from food, uh, drinking water, clothing, and ending with more comprehensive equipment such as uh, night heat vis uh, vision detectors and things like that. To automobiles, again, army the army had a, a high demand in automobiles that uh, were provided by the volunteers. High-tech equipment, as I mentioned, uh, expatriation of mortal remains, that was something that the volunteers um, took on doing as there were no resources to transport the uh, deceased soldiers back to their families. And so a lot of these things were done uh, by the volunteers on the money that was crowdfunded or otherwise fundraised uh, among the population. So there are veteran rehabilitation and services, and I think some of us know more <laughs> about that than uh, than, uh, than this, but uh, basically a lot of veteran rehabilitation and services were also taken over by the volunteers. This is one example of uh, battlefront volunteering. This is a, uh, a military uh, emergency uh, vehicle which was used for uh, transporting the wounded soldiers to the hospitals and which was also a volunteer-run initiative. 
uh, and also high precision tactical GIS mapping was something was an initiative of it's still it's ongoing it's an initiative of cartographers who realized that the Ukrainian army does not did not have the most comprehensive maps and so they uh, that's something that they could do and so there was an initiative of over a hundred people who helped create the high precision tactical GIS maps for the Ukrainian army and helped supply the uh, devices to read and train them how to uh, read these things and stuff like that so th these are just some of the initiatives that were uh, that were done by the battlefront volunteers in the context of this conflict this was an attempt to map the battlefront volunteering communities um, so we see the representatives of mass media is uh, are shown in green we see there's some uh, organizations there are diaspora organizations but we also see the central nodes the Euromaidan so it is evident from here as a kind of issue network that a lot of battlefront volunteering started during Maidan and uh, kind of stemmed from the organization that uh, that got created uh, during the time of Maidan. Uh, so now uh, to diasporic involvement of the Ukrainian conflict. Let me see how much time we have. Okay. Uh, so diasporas, uh, they're social groups that share a national identity while living outside of their country, but they're not um, stable communities, right? They are not everyone who lives outside of their country of origin identifies as uh, as a Ukrainian. And so the idea is that taking a social movement approach to diasporas as actors helps us understand the issues that mobilize diasporas and that really consolidate these, uh, these communities uh, in the times of crisis. And so crisis events happening in the homeland are big drivers for diasporic mobilization. And so there's a process known as tra translocalization, which is a multi-territorial arrangement in which diasporas are simultaneously local actors in their communities, they're national actors and they're global actors in the transnational context. So they're not just local or just global, but they kind of uh, work at all three levels of, of engagement. And they also leave digital traces, which makes digital media an interesting empirical site to study the transnational diasporic behavior. And so this was uh, this is, was where I was mapping the diasporic discourse on social media. So what I did is, is I found every group that identified as Ukrainians in the U.S. or in Canada. They might uh, identify as diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora in Canada, or Ukrainians in this in the city. So all of these groups uh, had public uh, face were organized as public Facebook groups. I had 10 uh, diasporic communities, five were in the US, five were in Canada. These were the only groups that were public uh, and that were consistently active throughout the military conflict. And so I was interested whether there were conversations about the Ukrainian conflict and whether there were conversations about delivering humanitarian aid to the Ukrainian conflict in particular. And I was also interested about con in context of diasporic engagements, what uh, did these actors do? In which context did they do one or the other? And so here's what I found. This is an example of a semantic network, which basically um, takes all of the nouns from the whole diasporic discourse. I did it for every group, and so I could see the structure of their discourse. I could see which words were connected to which words. So this is, uh, we have here an example of a political discussion about so we see country, Russia, power, Putin, word, time, year, person. They're discussing the Ukrainian politics. And so I found all 10 groups that engaged in political discussion, which was uh, unsurprising. But I also found the 10 groups engaged in humanitarian relief efforts. So just showing the scale of this behavior, right from anecdotal evidence that the diasporic actors support uh, the Ukrainian army to the direct evidence that there, there are these conversations and these fundraisers going on in these groups online was uh, something that, was, that I was very excited about. And, um, and I also found different contexts of diasporic engagement. In Canada, groups usually used trusted people. So there were trusted community activists that the Canadian diasporas cooperated with. In the US, there's much broader engagement. So there's engagement with trusted individuals, organizations, and also supporting a variety of social causes uh, that happened because of the conflict. So not only the Ukrainian army soldiers, but also broader. And so uh, what I could see is that digital media really facilitated the direct horizontal lines between diaspora members and affected communities. I saw a lot of posts where 
these community members were posting on the walls of the diaspora groups requests for help and they were, were answered. So these are the new <coughs> kinds of horizontal ties that uh, digital media allow uh, to facilitate uh, among people and this is something that is also very new. So, uh, so we have gone full circle back to the battlefront assemblages. I hope I illustrated each step of the process how um, this uh, young man could contribute uh, to the Ukrainian army, could help the uh, Ukrainian army soldiers. Uh, my conclusions are that focusing on only digital activism in mediated conflicts often obscures the networks of actors that work in the background. So just to draw attention to the materiality of the hybrid warfare and the, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of military scholars talk about the postmodern kind of uh, view of warfare in which um, modern conflicts are battle for battles for perceptions, which is very true, but also we have to remember about the materiality of the actual conflicts that are being fought. And also that by affording public participation, dig digital media uh, do not only influence perceptions, but also the outcomes of military conflict conflicts. That is something that, that I found that uh, I'm trying to work more on. And so going forward, Battlefront Assemblages is a book project that I'm hopeful to write next year. Uh, Battlefront Geographies is another project that came out of this research where I'm mapping the frames and traces of diasporic mobilization. So I'm looking at the origin of the uh, hyperlinks shared among diasporic groups to see which language content is used to mobilize diasporic groups and also where it was produced. Whether it's the Ukrainian conflict, the Ukrainian content, like Ukrainian news that gets shared in the groups that mobilize them or whether it's the US produced, US based media. And also the networks of micro resistance. Here you see a masking net so there's a very interesting uh, community of more than 500 organizations that make masking nets from scratch. These are military-grade masking nets. They are made by these communities. Uh, so another project um, is connected to these networks of micro-resistance. And I guess this is it. Thank you so much.